Living the dream, living aboard a blue water sailing boat, is probably one of the best things I've ever done in my life. I got my first boat when I, with a cabin when I was 30 years old. She was a 22 foot long little galleon. Four boats and some 20 years later, I purchased the 36 foot boat I was to sail around the world in. This was Bambola Cat, an Angus Primrose Moody 36. And I purchased her with the intention of starting blue water cruising and long distance sailing as a part-time liverboard. I think there are really sort of three types of liverboards and I confess in my time I've been all of them, sort of. The first type of liverboard is someone in a houseboat, a boat that is not going anywhere and was, um, except for the occasional lift out to clean the bottom. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes um, and are a way of living very inexpensively in a permanent home somewhere cheap or alternatively incredibly expensively in a floating home somewhere really really nice and expensive. There's a pretty big group of liverboards in Brighton Marina and in Littlehampton and South Dock Marina in London which has 130 residential berths and is run by the local council and there's probably dozens of other places all over the UK. Brighton Marina has some sort of houseboats which were purposely built and are sold by a stage agent and are probably very comfortable homes and just happen to be afloat. I spent a very challenging but not unhappy winter in a 39-foot steel sailing boat in South Dock Marina. It was pretty hard to keep the boat dry and warm in winter, constantly fighting mould in closed spaces like clothes cupboards, trips to the showers and loos in the pouring rain on ice-covered pontoons were not the best experience ever. Motorboats often offer more spacious accommodation than sailing boats for a given length and they're cheaper to buy simply because the cost of fuel is so high. When a rich person gives up their motorboat, a, poor, a poorer person can very often find it uh, at a real bargain price, but they can't afford to run it. But most sailing and motorboats have insufficient insulation, less than a caravan, and were never designed to be lived in during, southern, uh, during northern winter months. I also lived for a year or two in a Vaughan boat uh, on a canal in the centre of Amsterdam. I had central heating, excellent insulation, mains electricity, water uh, together with cable TV. It was a very pleasant floating apartment uh, with a nice terrace. It was no hardship at all and great fun. To be very clear, in the UK, whilst in summer it's absolutely lovely, parked up in a boat in the winter the problems of heating it and keeping it dry are frequently huge. The second type of liverboard is a sort of semi-transitory. Folks who've got a proper sailing boat and live on board but really don't move much. They've got to a place they like um, and except for the occasional sail during the summer they more or less stay put. Sometimes they live in liverboard communities like Brighton, South Dock but more more often it's somewhere nice and warm like Portugal, Spain, Greece or Turkey. They've sailed down from the UK, found somewhere they like and just stayed. There is now a bit of a problem with this with Brexit. In the old days um, a lot of Liverpool folks chose to live um, below, the, uh, below the horizon, not follow all the international rules and it really worked. It's much harder in 2022, almost impossible, because unless you have an EU passport, you'll get an entry stamp or an electronic code on your passport, allowing you only to stay for 90 days. So what to do? You can take out residency in your new country of choice, but they'll all want proof that you can financially support yourself and not be a burden. In France, it's a pretty long-winded and complicated process and there's no great imperative for them to allow you to stay. Their medical and social systems are pretty good and pretty valuable assets to the state and their marinas are expensive. 
Spain's easier because the tourist trade is an important part of their economy. Uh, you still have to prove a level of wealth and an ability to support yourself. Portugal really wants to have newcomers and they're keen to invite new residents provided they're reasonably self-sufficient. That's why all the marinas along the Algarve coast have a considerable con contingent of UK liverboards. Turkey is also keen to have new residents and they have an easy access five-year residency scheme which makes it pretty easy to become a liverboard in one of their sunny excellent marinas. Greece makes up its own rules whatever the EU, say, EU says so I'm not sure how strict they will actually be. But be aware no country will welcome you as a resident unless you can prove you're financially stable and have a fixed income that they consider reasonable. Probably the majority of folks in this category of liverboard are retired and living on their pensions. A few people will have found work in their local community and put down roots, although the majority of those are in the process of moving ashore in all likelihood. As you sail south towards the sun, in every marina on the way you're going to find abandoned dreams, boats left to rot because the reality didn't live up to the dream, or they found the sea scary, or simply they ran out of money. And the third sort of liverboards are nomads, which is what I've been for a considerable part of my life, I think. Have sailboat, will travel. And it worked for me for many years as it combined my professional life as a freelance teledirector with my passion for messing about in boats. I would finish my work on a production, uh, get onto the boat and voyage somewhere until my agent telephoned to say the next job had come up for me. I would then stick the boat in the nearest marina, jump on a jet plane and turn a buck and enjoy myself because I actually loved the job. There's no business like it. Let me dispel a few myths about the nomadic liverboard. I'm going to anchor everywhere so I don't need to have to spend any money on marinas. Well, with very few exceptions that's simply not true in the Mediterranean. It's hard to find anchorages and in winter there are gales and rumours of gales everywhere. You really do need to be in a marina for the winter period for the security of your boat and in summer Brexit's made it difficult to find non-EU countries to anchor in. I'm going to find work locally and top up my finances. It just doesn't work like that unless you're a professional diesel marine engineer, which is about the only skill I know of that can normally always find work. There's a lot of unemployment around the world, around the Mediterranean, and many local people are willing to work for very low wages and on the black. Marine diesel engineers are always sought after, and so are pretty barmaids who speak the local language and English. Otherwise, forget it. I'm going to fish, so I don't need too much money for food. Well, good luck with that. On passage, I normally put a couple of lines over the stern, and I do catch fish sometimes, but never enough to totally sustain myself, nowhere near. On anchorages with dinghies running about and other boats anchored nearby, it's hard to catch anything significant, although diving with a spear gun is sometimes a better bet. I'm going to start a YouTube channel and make money filming my boat repair skills and my sailing adventures. Really? Well, everyone and his dog, well, sailboat, are out there doing just that and 99% don't even get sufficient subscribers to monetize. You need 100 subscribers just to be allowed to get a name for your channel and 1,000 to make money out of it. Worldwide, there are hundreds, even thousands of boat owners with YouTube channels and getting to where you actually make serious money out of it is very, very difficult, almost impossible. Of course, there are some sailing YouTube stars like Sailing Humor, brilliant channel. Old Man, uh, Old Sea Dog, great channel. The Wildings, lovely couple, who clearly make, some, make significant incomes from their channels, mainly out of the advertising, Patreons, and memberships, and coffee fees 
and promoting stuff and merchandise. There are thousands of YouTube channels out there and only a few ever become stars. You need an awful lot of subscribers, an awful lot of Patreons to live off it. And don't forget, I'm talking about film stars of YouTube sailing channels, the highly successful ones. So why are so many liverboards starting YouTube channels? Well, I'll tell you a secret. After a while, even blue water cruising can become boring when there's nothing else to do. I was making sailing videos a hundred years ago, which were sold mainly to the USA on VHS and later DVDs. First, I was visiting some very exciting places and I wanted to sort of keep a record for myself. And secondly, I liked making little movies, which I'd been doing since I was a kid. And because I was getting bored, I wanted to find something to do besides anchor watch and fixing the boat. A lady, long distance uh, sailor I knew once said, blue water cruising is in reality repairing boats in exotic locations. And somebody else said, circumnavigating is just crossing three oceans and a lot of local sailing. It's estimated that there are always around 750 boats actually sailing around the world at any moment in time. And they, few, they all have a few inescapable costs. You must have third party insurance or marinas and even a few countries won't let you stay. Although that sort of co coverage is pretty inexpensive. Insurance for your boat being damaged or a write-off is certainly not that cheap. You shouldn't try to get worldwide insurance. The trick is just to insure the, in the area that you're currently sailing in and then change it um, just as you're going to move on. Some sort of medical insurance is sensible. I caught Lyme's disease in Cambridge, Maryland, USA, and I had a gallbladder out in Phuket, Thailand. So none of us are immune and hospital bills are, well, significant. You could, uh, you could lose a lot. It could cost you your boat even. Sailing around the world is wonderful and a very special experience which very few others have done compared to the hundreds and thousands of boats worldwide sitting more or less permanently in their marinas or ports. So how do you finance it? The difficult part isn't really buying the boat or fixing the boat up. The hard part is having sufficient income to live on day by day without working. Unless you are born rich, retired early or have a pension, it's really, really difficult. One source of income is to have rental property, a house or an apartment you own that you can rent out. There are risks with this because tenants don't always pay the rent, the roof blows off or the central heating boiler dies, but it is certainly a way of sustaining a sailing lifestyle. There are an awful lot of grey-haired couples with pensions out there renting their homes out while they sail around the world just living the dream. Possibly the nearest and best place to live aboard 365 is the Caribbean, where anchorages abound, far, far more anchorages than marinas. In the two or three years I was there, I don't think I went into a marina more than once, except for fuel and water, or to lay the boat up for the hurricane season and to come home. The Caribbean has so many different countries, Almost every, almost every island is an independent state from Trinidad to the Bahamas, so there are no residency problems. There are no damp problems, no cold problems, and no marina fees. Sure, the cost of maintaining a boat is higher, but you can have stuff couriered in from West Marine or Defenders in the USA, where it'll be sent to you at your marina for American prices rather than European. Okay, so there's a problem with the hurricane season. Well, there are two solutions. Either risk it, every island is not hit by a hurricane every year, and thousands of boats just stay put very successfully. Or you head south or southwest and anchor up for the summer. Trinidad and Chagaramas Bay or the ABC Islands, uh, Curacao, 
particularly, are not very far away. And you can join the liverboard communities in the various anchorages for high summer uh, in the hurricane-free zones. Another great cruising area is Mexico, which is, of course, very attractive to Americans, as that coastline joins both Texas and California. Somewhat shallow, but stacks of living board anchorages all the way south to Panama and the San Blas Islands. And then there's Asia, Indonesia, thousands of islands, very few marinas and low living costs. You just have to watch out for the cyclone season. I loved it there, but I think it does need local knowledge and there are limits to how long you can stay. For example, in Thailand, without a residency permit, it's, it's very short indeed. It's like a month or six weeks. I can only speak for myself, but I've always had to come ashore after a few months um, living on the boat. I just have to get off the boat for a while. Even when I was sailing in exotic places, and I still needed to get to a land base sometimes. So I used to be grateful when the hurricane or cyclone season came around. I mean, I could then just park the boat up ashore, get in a jet plane and fly back to Europe for a few months. There is a limit for most people as to how long you can live in a boat, even when you're parked up in a marina. It's fine for a few years, but in the end, the deterioration of the boat and the inconvenience will make shore-based existence seem attractive. To be fair, I do know one couple who are just starting their third circumnavigation. They're, certainly, they're presently in the Caribbean, but they are the exceptions. For lesser mortals like me, just crossing the Atlantic again is all the challenge I want. And living just part of the year in an anchorage in the Caribbean is going to be just perfect. Shipping the boat across on a cargo vessel has become hideously expensive, so sailing across the pond again seems the likelihood solution for me, next year's project. So, this was all a very personal dream of living aboard. I hope sharing, with you been, sharing it with you has been helpful. It's truly worth the effort, but it's equally not for everyone. See you out there again sometime. Fair winds, safe landfalls. Bye. So far, French Canal Route to the Mediterranean has sold over 2,700 copies. And the, the gentle sailing route to the Mediterranean, that's down the outside coast, has also sold over 1,850 copies so far. If you want a copy of any of my sailing books, then they're available as instant downloads from gentlesailing.com, all one word. Or if you want my articles and descriptions about sailing, uh, you'll find them at michaelbrandt.com.